Hey guys, Kodo Crypto here with a new market video update. Excited for this one. We're going to talk about a lot of things in this one. We're going to talk about Bitcoin, obviously. We're also going to talk about a lot of altcoins. We're going to revisit a lot of the meme coins that we talked about two months ago in my meme apocalypse video. We're also going to cover uh, some other altcoins. And we're going to talk about the market kind of as a whole right now. Pretty important level in a variety of different ways. So we'll, we'll cover quite a bit here. It should be a pretty comprehensive overview of not just Bitcoin, but kind of the market as a whole. Um, at the end of this video, I'm going to go through and and take some of the questions on Twitter that you guys have. I just recently tweeted that I would be recording this video and I asked if you guys have any questions to put them in the comments of that tweet. I'll be going through that tweet and I'll go over some of the questions that you guys have directly. If this goes well, we'll try and do this with every video. That way, I know you guys ask me a lot of questions throughout the week and I don't make videos every day. So sometimes I may miss some of those questions. So this is my way of kind of making sure that I address what I think are probably some of the more important questions. A lot of this stuff I've already covered. So if I'm not answering it, it probably means I've already covered it, but there's certain questions that I think are worth touching on in these videos. Stay till the end for that because I will be going over some of those questions on my Twitter. With that being said, guys, let's jump right into it. We'll start with Bitcoin and then we'll go on to some of our alts. With Bitcoin specifically, guys, we were trading right around, I believe it was this wick that I was recording on. We were trading right around 58K. And basically I'd said that at that point, because we had hit, our local invalidation, which was the lows at 60K. And again, I explained why these were significant in prior videos. So I won't go over it in too much depth, but this was our local invalidation. So after hitting these lows at 60K, that opened up the doors, as I said in my last video, for significantly lower without technically invalidating higher time frame structures. So despite lower time frame invalidation being hit, which was again that 60K level, higher time frame structure has not been compromised. And I don't think that it will be. It would take a lot for higher time frame structure to really get affected here. And again, I don't think that that's going to happen. And let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the 60K level really briefly. So I had a lot of people say that, well, you were bullish as long as 60K wasn't met. You were bullish at 64K, you were bullish at 65K, and now you're flipping bearish at 60K. You're, you're crazy. You don't know what you're doing. And I want to make it really clear as to why I was very bullish above 60K and why I'm now a little bit more cautious. High time frame, I remain very, very bullish. So one issue is that people get confused with the time frames that I'm referring to. And in my last video, I actually explained why despite 60K being hit, it does not mean, as I said in the last video, that we can't simply go here and then reverse or that we can't simply go here and then reverse, right? It simply means that the impulsive structure or the lower time frame uptrend that it started had been invalidated, which means we need to form a new lower time frame uptrend to see continuation on the higher time frame uptrend. So again, whenever we see an impulsive move, which is basically just a lower time frame uptrend, which again, what is the definition of an uptrend? Let me try and make this real simple. The definition of an uptrend is a series of higher highs and higher lows. Okay, that is the definition of an uptrend. What is a series? A series is plural, meaning you need to have more than one higher high and higher low. This was a very clean impulse. We use this as an example here at 24K that we identified back at the time. You have a low, you have a high, okay? This is your first higher low, okay? But for an impulse or for a trend, you need a series of higher lows and higher highs. So we have a low, we have a high, a higher low, higher high, higher low. This is our second higher low and a second higher high. This now completes a series of higher lows and higher highs. And when you have a series of higher lows and higher highs, you have a five wave move. That is where we get the idea and the logic behind a five wave move starting a trend or starting a lower time frame trend because that is by the very definition a series of higher highs the one and the three and a series of higher lows the two and the four and when you get a combination of a series of higher highs and higher lows you have a trend and so that is where the five waves comes from it's not it's just it's simply just market structure but most people don't realize this and so they don't understand the logic behind key levels of invalidation now i want to make something very clear when you can identify a series of higher highs and higher lows, when you can identify the start of a trend on lower time frames, there's a high likelihood that that trend continues on to higher time frames. And again, that can be again shown here. We had a lower time frame impulse start, and that lower time frame uptrend continued into a higher time frame uptrend. Another series of higher highs and higher lows in a higher time frame, right? And that that made up our third wave. So what we're simply trying to do is identify the start of the next major wave, the initial leg up, the initial lower time frame uptrend of the next much larger, higher time frame uptrend. And we can do that by looking for these waves of five. And the reason that the invalidation is so important is because that is a key level that must be defended if we are ready for a continuation of the trend. If that level is breached, 
then that means that we're not quite ready for the next trend to start. And that means that we're still in a corrective structure. And so I got stopped out of a lot of longs here on this breach of 60 K. Okay. I took a loss, but if it were to happen again, people ask me, would you change your bias next time? Why were you so bullish about 60 K? There's literally nothing I would change. I would take this trade 10 out of 10 times because yes, it's not going to work every single time. You're going to get some invalidations. You're going to get stopped out at some times, but when it works, you can identify the start of a much larger trend. Whenever you see a lower time frame uptrend form, I like the one that we showed here, you simply have to assume that the lows of this trend will be defended, okay? And sometimes they're gonna get hit. The invalidation is gonna get hit. But that doesn't mean that the analysis was incorrect or erroneous, right? You have to assume that these lows will be defended until they're breached. Again, back here at 24K, 24.8K, you can go look at my tweets. I have a ton of tweets saying, back once we completed this five wave move, that it doesn't matter how deep we go, as long as these lows aren't breached, we're gonna make a higher low and see another impulse, okay? And so even down here at 25.3K, when many were calling for a move down to 21 and 22K, I said, as long as 24.6K hasn't been breached, you guys are jumping the gun. And I was extremely bullish at these lows, right? Extremely bullish at these lows because invalidation hadn't been hit. And what followed was a move from 25K to 75K, literally a 200% move to the upside followed. So if we were here again, after printing a five wave move and we're down at 26K and you're wondering why I'm still bullish, it's because invalidation hasn't been hit. There's no reason for me to become bearish at 63K, at 64K, at 65K when invalidation is at 60K. Yes, in this instance, it didn't work out. These don't have a 100% strike rate. Nothing ever does. But you can't start turning bearish this close to invalidation because the risk reward, if we're right, and if the slow is defended, the risk reward is usually pretty substantial. And again, just to give you guys an idea, if you had entered along here at 28K with invalidation at 24K, and we went down very close to invalidation, but never hit, and then you rode the next impulse to the upside, that's a 12 to 13 R trade, assuming you got to the top, obviously, there's no guarantees you'd get out at the top. But if you follow the impulse, you know that we had one here. We had a correction. We have a third impulse. You need at least five impulses. You need at least five ways. This was your major fourth. This was your major fifth wrapping up. You probably would have exited somewhere around here thinking, okay, the fifth wave is wrapping up. That's a 10-hour trade. You can lose this trade 10 times, and it only needs to hit once for you to become profitable. So anytime we're this close to invalidation, just because we're bleeding down and it doesn't look like we're going to stop, doesn't mean you flip bearish until invalidation is hit. And then you understand, okay, the idea has been invalidated. I take my loss. I move on. I look for the next setup. But it doesn't make any sense for people to flip bearish, at least based on my strategy, for me to flip bearish just because we didn't bounce off 67K. Oh, we went lower to 66, 65. doesn't matter. We haven't hit invalidation. We hit invalidation. Okay, I reassess. But until that point, you don't want to flip bearish or you don't want to change your bias prematurely because look what that would have gotten you here. You would have essentially sold the bottom thinking we're going to hit validation. Invalidation has never hit. Massive reversal. Uh, by the time you realize what's happening, we're probably up $10,000, $20,000, okay? So again, this is one example, but of course, you know our invalidations, uh, they apply for every impulse. We had an impulse off of these lows, five waves up, we came down, retraced to this area of demand, reversed impulse. So you're just looking for these lower time from impulses, and I would be bullish at 64K again and again and again and again and again, even if invalidation is at 60K, because the odds are that more often than not, you're going to get a positive gain by looking for these impulses and, and holding the validations, right? Now that 60K has been hit, okay, idea has been invalidated. Now we wait for the next impulse. This is what I discussed in my last YouTube video, so I won't cover it too much. Well, let's talk about downside targets and what I'm looking for here. We're approaching that 53K area, which is the next area of support. Below that, we have, you can take this actually this entire zone as a cluster of demand, okay? In other words, an area of support. It's a big zone, but that's exactly what it is. And how do you identify this? It's the consolidation or the down move before the last major move to the upside. So you can consider the whole area between 40 to 49K, super high time frame support, okay? And again, keep in mind what we're looking at here, guys. We're looking at a five wave move to the upside of which we've completed three waves. We're working on the fourth wave, which is a corrective wave. We have the fifth wave left to go. I know this looks ugly and it looks scary, but you zoom out and it's really not that bad. Obviously, alts are taking a br the brunt of the damage here as Bitcoin bleeds. A little bit lower than I was expecting, but Bitcoin structure is still extremely healthy. And so you don't want to get this confused. I see people calling for the top of the bull market already. And I'm like, there's nothing to, to make you think the top is it at this point. We have very, very clear structure here. And I want to also emphasize that 
you have to consider that for a move that started at 25k and that went to 75k technically the depth of the retracement thus far on this fourth wave i think it's like 25 percent if i'm not mistaken for a retracement of a move even 50% is considered technically fine, right? We'll talk about in this context, it's a little di different, but in a normal impulse, even if you get a 50, a lot of times a 61.8% is a very key level. They call it the golden ratio. Very, very significant level at 61.8. That's considered a normal slash healthy retracement, okay? So the fact that we've gone from 72 down to 58 doesn't mean it's the end of the world. Doesn't mean the bull market is over. Doesn't mean that we've entered some new mega bear territory. None of that, guys. This is a normal and healthy retracement. That being said, when the markets are very, very bullish, we don't expect super deep retracements. Okay. So again, in the context of any other normal impulse or, or trending move to the upside, a 50 to 60% retracement is considered normal and healthy. In the context of where we're at in this market, it's not necessarily to be expected. And kind of what I mean by that is you can take a look at our first impulse here and you can see that the correction that followed was relatively sideways. We had a, let's take a look at how deep the retracement was on this move, we had about a little over a 25%, probably a 30% retracement on this wave two. And the market's being as bullish as we expect with what we believe to be a parabolic blow off top coming. That's similar to what we'd expect here, kind of like a 40% retracement. 50% would be a little bit surprising to me, but it's it's not technically impossible, right? And it's still, it's still technically valid. So if you actually look at the corrective structure we have here, this can be considered relatively sideways. When you consider that it's correcting a move up from 25K off of these lows, this is considered a relatively sideways correction, just like this was, okay? So please keep this in context of the bigger picture. A lot of people freaking out right now when they really shouldn't be. The markets are healthy, despite us breaking the 60K level, okay? Now let's talk about downside targets on Bitcoin, and we'll talk about alts here shortly as well. So in terms of downside targets now, I previously, in my last video, talked about how we had a lot of buildup of short positions that were likely to be liquidated at some point. And we had a lack of kind of long position buildup down here at 58K. And I also noted that that can change over time, right? At the time that I recorded the video, I believe we had a ratio of like one to 10 in terms of directional shorts versus directional longs. And again, these are estimations. This is not concrete data. This is what we are estimating based on the data. And after recording that video, we saw some more buildup of these long positions. And today we have quite a few more built up below. So what's happening essentially is at the time we recorded, there was a pretty significant liquidation of the downside here at 58K, wiped out a lot of longs. We kind of consolidated here, chopped around, but we got a lot of buildup of additional leverage positions that followed in the hours and days that followed this move. And we then went and liquidated those. So the idea being that as long as we get this leverage buildup of positions, which you can estimate based on looking at open interest, which we'll take a look at in a second, as long as you continue to get a buildup of positions here, that's more fuel for the fire, more fuel for liquidations in either direction up or down. And so the depth of this correction totally depends on two things, right? Spot selling and long and short liquidations. So the amount of leverage buildup as well as the amount of spot selling. We've also seen what, what looked to be significant spot selling here as well, okay? And I wanna again emphasize because I've had some people say we went down to sub 60K so easily, you know, there's nothing, not much stopping us from 40K. And I made a tweet on that topic and I pointed out that the amount of effort it took for us to, to go down from 70K down to sub 60K. Now this looks like, oh, well, it was so easy for us to break 60K, but the amount of effort it took for us to actually break 60K was very, very significant. It was a very significant effort of selling here that, that was required to make us move this low. So I do not think that there's nothing standing here in the way of 40K. There's a lot between us and those levels. There is active accumulation absorption occurring here. There's just a lot of sell pressure too. But let me show you that tweet for context. So this is the tweet that I want to refer to. And it says, people underestimate how much sell pressure would take to bring us back to the 40Ks at this time. Even the move back down to 60K was no easy feat. It took about 400 million of net market buy pressure on Coinbase slash Binance to make the move off our lows of 56K to the local highs of 72K. It took over 1.5 billion of net market sell pressure on these same exchanges to move us back down to our range lows from the local highs. And we still haven't broken down and made a lower low below 56K. It took a lot of effort to get us where we are now. There's undeniable absorption occurring with this range. And let me show you guys what I'm talking about here. So again, we can look at OBV to tell us the amount of aggregate spot market buying and selling pressure, right? So you can look at from this low to our local highs here, OBV increased a little bit. It increased by about $400 million worth 
of, of Bitcoin, of buy pressure. So there's about $400 million worth of market buys in between this point at 56K and our local highs at 72K, meaning it took 400 million, a net positive of $400 million of buys to push us up $10,000. The amount of effort it took to bring us back down to those levels was significantly more. It took us $1.5 billion worth of sell pressure, spot sell pressure to bring us back down to these levels. So basically what this tells us is that because it was a lot easier to move up than it was to move down, there was a lot of sell pressure here, market selling pressure, but there was absorption or buying occurring on the way down. And so because there was this buying occurring on the way down from passive buyers or limit buyers, it's a lot more market sell pressure to move price down, okay, versus when it went up. The point being made here is that there is absorption. There is buying occurring on the way down here to counteract that massive amount of spot selling, right? Now, who's selling the spot? There have been some posts on Twitter talking about the German government selling some confiscated Bitcoin. Of course, there's other government entities like the U.S. government that has some Silk Road Bitcoin that I believe they, they sold some of that. The bottom line is that there has been some selling here. I'm not going to come out and say that this drop is specifically caused by the German government selling or anything of that nature. It really isn't too relevant, right? All that matters is that there was an increase, kind of an unprecedented increase in spot selling pressure on this way down, which we can confirm by looking at the data. And that increase in spot selling pressure is probably what made us break this lower time frame uptrend that had begun, right? So if that entity, whether it be the German government or someone else, was not selling so much spot so aggressively, we may never have broken 60K and we may simply have put in a higher longer and continued our uptrend, right? Which is what I was initially betting on. It's always hard to know who's doing what in this market. So I don't like to make assumptions about the German government is selling, so we must go down or anything like that nature. For what it's worth, if I'm not mistaken, the, the German government has sold at least half of that Bitcoin and only half is left. Uh, again, you don't want to kind of focus too much on these things because a lot of times the information that we have versus what's actually there is not 100% accurate. You know that the German government, for example, may be selling Bitcoin. You don't know who's on the other end absorbing it all, right? So as we saw, despite the significant increase in selling here, we had a lot of absorption. So there's other entities that are counteracting that selling it at, at any given time. And it's not always as easy as the headlines make it seem. So again, I don't want too much focus or importance to be placed on these headlines. I'm just trying to explain what may have happened here that may have caused us to break our lower time frame uptrend that had begun, right? We saw clear absorption at these levels. We saw a new uptrend start, and then we saw the sell pressure come in that pushed us down. In any case, guys, downside targets, we have a clear area of demand here at 53K. And what I want to emphasize and what I've tweeted about before is that for us to get confirmation that the next leg up is starting here, we need to see a lower time frame impulse. We need to see a lower time frame impulse like the one we saw here at 38K. Oh, I'll also add, guys, the same way that we identified the lower time frame impulse here at 25K and we had a trade setup longing with an invalidation at these lows, the same exact setup could, could have been taken here. And we took it. We took it at these levels as well. And we rode Bitcoin up significantly higher. Why? Because we saw a lower time frame impulse. So therefore, we knew that this is our lower time frame invalidation. Therefore, we knew that we should be buying the dip. We bought the dip. We put our stop loss at the lows. And we came out of this with, again, a five to six to seven hour trade. Meaning, again, you're making seven times as much as you stand to lose. So this is why I will always take those trades. Even if I understand that, you know, they're not going to work out 100% of the time. They don't need to work out 100% of the time. They don't even need to work out 50% of the time because the risk to reward on these types of trades in such a massive uptrend is significant. And so anytime you see these types of little impulses form, I'll probably be trading them. I'll probably be taking that setup. And if the validation hits, I need to reassess. But as long as it doesn't hit, I assume that we're going to head higher and that those lows will be defended. Okay. Just because it doesn't work out one time doesn't mean that I ignore the setup next time because more often than not, it does work out. And it has a good strike rate and the payoff is significant if, if it does work out. So what we're looking for is, again, a lower time frame impulse. Something like what we saw here, we get one again. I'm going to be interested in taking another long setup. Simple as that. We can look at our data, obviously, for confluence. But for now, we don't have that, okay? And so this is why in, in my last tweet, I went on a little vacation the other day or a wedding I attended out of town. Before I went on the wedding, I tweeted out that Local invalidation has been hit. We're seeing a build up in open interest again. Uh, we'll talk about that here in a second. But I basically said that we don't have any sort of confirmation that the bottom is yet in because we don't have an impulse to move off of these lows. No impulse means no confirmation that our bottom is in, which means we could technically go lower. Thus far, we're chopping about. But again, we don't have impulsive price action yet. Okay. This key area that I've marked off in red is our local supply that we broke down from. That means that this key area is a key area of resistance. And so we want to get above it. Two things. You want to get back above this area, which is 
currently at 60 to 63K, 64K. And we want to see an impulse. Okay, well, we do both those things and we're good to go and attempt another long. Until then, we sit in our hands and we wait to see how low we go. And again, we can go lower. The next area of interest or of demand is this green zone here at 50 to 53K. And below that is our very, very high time frame demand. Okay, it's hard to say which one we're going to tag and bounce off of and form reversal. Ideally, we form some sort of a range after tapping one of these areas of support. And if we can form a nice range here, a nice bottoming structure, and then we get a nice impulse off that breaks, again, the red zone, then that is your indication to, again, look for longs. The very logical entry is obviously on a retest of the red zone, right? You look to buy this flip of this area of resistance. You place your stop loss at the lows, okay? Place your stop loss at the lows. What are we targeting? We're targeting 100K plus. That's a minimum of 4R, probably going to be significantly more than that. Once you get the next lower impulse off of this level, you can then raise your stop losses, compound the move. And that's that's how I've been playing every single one of these major impulses up off since 28K. And so that's basically what we're looking for, right? There's always levels of invalidation or levels of confidence that you can have when entering a position. The most aggressive people will buy the dip on the way down and they need to be comfortable with being underwater because we could dip lower than you're expecting. If you don't have that confidence or if you're worried about that or if you can't afford to be in a position if price is bleeding lower than you'd expect, then wait for the confirmation, wait for the impulse, wait for the trend shift. And at that point, you can get into a more comfortable, less risky long. You're going to pay more for it, of course, but you won't have to worry about us continuing to bleed while you're in a position. And being overly aggressive is probably the biggest mistake for most new traders here because they want to get in position and they get in position aggressively. And then we go down, either they don't set a stop loss on their trade or they start panicking as we move into what will be, if we get there, a massive area of support or demand that we would expect a reversal at. And so they end up panicking at the worst time because now it's sub 50K, ignoring the fact that this is actually, the next biggest area of demand on this chart is this zone here. Right? I'm not saying we're gonna go down here. No, not at all. Okay, we're not gonna go down to 30K. Not gonna happen. Of course, I'll never say anything is 100%, but if we go down to 30K, then this, <laughs> then this idea is all wrong. There's no way that we should go that low, period, okay? But at the points at which, it makes the most sense to be long. You have to keep emotions out of it, right? Over here, when we were above 60K, the closer that we got to 60K, the more you should be standing on your bullish position because invalidation is so close. Anything above 60 was the most likely place to reverse. Now that 60K is broken, the next area that is the most likely place to see reversal is anything in this bigger green zone. Doesn't mean we have to get there. But it does mean that if we get there, you should not be freaking out. You should not be selling in this zone. You should be buying. Again, not financial advice, but from a trader's perspective, this is the way that you need to look at things. And most people will, instead of looking at these areas as areas of opportunity, if we get them, they'll look at these areas as areas where they, they start panicking. Well, why? Because they're not looking at the higher time frame structure. They're thinking we're down below 50. This was not supposed to happen. Therefore, we must be super bearish. And then they end up selling at the bottom. And I've been saying since we were at 64K, right? We actually, on this bounce, I tweeted that we've now bounced up to 63 to 64K. We're either going to impulse breakthrough here or we're going to reject. What happened? We rejected, right? And I said, until we get a five wave impulse, we didn't have one here. We had three waves up. And I said, until we get five waves, we have to be cautious. We got three waves up. We rejected. We have not gotten a clear impulse since 64K. And we're now trading at 57K. We went as low as 53K. No impulse present. So if you really want that confirmation, wait for the impulse. That's all you have to do, okay? Now, with Bitcoin out of the way, with that being said, let's take a look at some of the data here on Velo. We'll talk about some of our metrics that we like to cover, and then we'll go on to altcoins, okay? So again, we're looking for an impulse. 53K is the next area of support. What does our data look like right now? We have had a decent reduction in open interest off of this, this drop here. You can see that open interest is now back below what I like to call the danger zone. Again, baseline or like a reset of open interest occurs right around here, okay? So open interest hitting the green line is ideal. And remember, remember this, there's some some percentage of this open interest is going to be short positions that are only going to get liquidated as we push up. So you, we don't necessarily need to see this open interest drop back down to the green level because a green level is the point where all the open interest is wiped out. Theoretically, for us to get there, if that means a wipeout of all the wipeable open interest, we would need to see some, some price action of the upside, right? To wipe out the shorts to bring us down. So don't necessarily look for a touch of the green zone here on open interest to think that we can't bottom until we hit green because we could bottom and then push up and wipe out some shorts and then hit green. 
So we don't actually need to get a full reset on open interest. Of course, the lower it goes, the better because the lower it goes, the less leverage is, is within the market. Our spot premium is still strong our funding is pretty much neutral. So these are both healthy, not much to, to really look at there. I'm gonna go ahead and minimize those. You can see that we still have significant spot sell-offs occurring, right? Throughout this range, we've had significant spot selling occurring, but we've also had significant absorption as I explained in the, in the last earlier part of this video. We're barely below this low, yet we've seen a lot more spot selling, about 30,000 Bitcoin worth of spot sell-offs from Binance and Coinbase. 30,000 Bitcoin is approximately $1.6 billion worth of Bitcoin selling off on spot, yet we're, we're actually trading slightly above this low. So that's my point that I'm trying to make here is there's been a lot of selling of Bitcoin here, but price is not moving down nearly as aggressive as you would have expected, which means there's lots of buying here too. There's absorption, right? I like that open interest is now almost like halfway back to where it was. That's nice to see. I'm glad it's not continuing to rise. That's a good sign. Just as we push into again, our first key area of demand and the major area of support. So again, looking for something like this, where again, we don't have impulsive price action, we have resistance here. So I can see us pushing up to resistance and then coming down for another wick into this area of demand. And at that point, I'd like to see a nice little base form here, and then we can look for the impulse. If this area is lost, of course, then we eye up the much larger area of demand below. Oh, one question I get a lot. Have your 100K targets by August, September, October changed? Uh, keep in mind that I have bought calls for the end of July and August. See, the, the July calls are probably going to expire worthless. I've lost that trade. Uh, the August calls, though, I think that there's still a chance that they can hit. Again, Bitcoin needs to be above $82,000 for those August calls of mine to be profitable. And so we need to be above here by end of August, okay? So what I want to kind of emphasize is that from where we are now at 57K, the next rise up, when this correction does finally complete, okay, whether that be tomorrow, whether it be a week from now, when it does complete, the rise up that follows will be more aggressive than prior rise. I've said this so many times that I want to emphasize. So people ask me, has your 100K target by the end of October changed? This is kind of what I want to, to make very clear, okay? If this last leg up from here to here, that's around $33,000 move, that took from January 24th to March 8th. Okay, that's about a month and a half. If we moved $30,000 in a month and a half, and the next leg up is gonna be more aggressive, and we're currently trading at 57K, then if you can just extrapolate this forward, then from August to October, which is three months, technically we should move up at least $60,000 at a minimum. This assumes again that the correction is finished by then when we start the next leg up. If we're going to move up $60,000 within this time frame, and we're currently trading at 57, that puts us at $117,000. So no, my long-term projections, my projections about targets for October will not change. So I keep getting the question. They're not going to change. I'm not going to change them based on lower time from price action because it's based on a higher time from idea, right? When will I change my targets? Well, if we're down to a month and a half before the end of October, and we have, let's say, more than $40,000, $45,000 to move up to hit 100K plus, then I'll say it's probably not going to happen. Until then, if I already know that the move up is likely to be more aggressive than the last leg up, then we have plenty of time to get to 100K plus by the end of October. There's no reason for me to deviate from that because of some lower time frame changes in price action. So I just want to make that clear. I get that question a lot. I ignore it most of the time because I've already said there's no reason for me to change targets that are months out when I know how quickly and aggressively we can move up once this correction is complete. Obviously, I won't know when this correction completes. And if this correction continues on into September, like late September, then obviously at that point, okay, we may not reach 100K by October. But as long as, I mean, th this correction can end tomorrow. We don't know when it's going to end. So uh, there's no point in me changing my bias now is what I'm getting at, okay? So with that out of the way, guys, we're just looking for a bottom to form here. I think we're close, okay? Obviously, I think we're close. We're going to take a look at some alts now. All right, guys, so this is another tweet and this refers back to a clip that I had in my meme apocalypse, the second video, I had two of the videos, the second video where I talked about what I'm looking for in terms of downside targets and a lot of these altcoins to start looking for bullish moves up again. When I made this video, a lot of people scoffed at it, disagreed with it, made fun of it, and everything pretty much played out. So we're gonna go over that here in a second, but I wanna play the clip and then we'll take a look at the chart today and we'll go from there and start talking about alts as a whole, because I think this is a important topic to be discussed and there's a bit of nuance here that you need to pay attention to. So let's go ahead and take a look at that clip and we'll go from there excluding Bitcoin and Ethereum. It's a good gauge for how the alt market as a whole is doing. And you can see here that we have had significant upside off of our lows, a very clean accumulation bottom, significant low put in, higher low put in, and then mark up to the upside. We've now hit levels that we 
didn't quite reach or we reached a little bit higher in 2021, but I think we're going to go much higher by the time this is over. But we do have what I believe again to be the second leg of this correction down yet to occur. All right, guys. So that little snippet was from my meme apocalypse part two video that I shared about two months ago. If you want to go back and watch that video, you can, although we'll cover a lot of that here in this video and talk about for progress you've made since that clip. Let's just take a look at the total three chart and go from there. All right, guys. So this is the total three chart from that video. Again, when we recorded that video, we we're trading right around here. And I said, we need another leg down. It looks like we're going to get another leg down at this area of demand. Again, in that video, I talked about what would follow, which is another massive leg to the upside to one plus trillion dollars of market cap for alts as a whole. Again, keep in mind that this is total two, which is total crypto market cap, excluding Bitcoin and Ethereum. And so again, I was looking for another leg down. We got another leg down. We're in this area of demand or support. Again, the move down before the big move up. This is where we'd start to expect to see some of these alts bottom. Okay, And what follows this is the next impulse to the upside, just like how we got one here, just like how we got on Bitcoin, exactly for what we're looking on Bitcoin, another five-way move to the upside that takes us to the end of this cycle. Okay. Now, what I want to talk about here, the nuance that I described, again, in my Memepocalypse video, I talked about a lot of altcoins that I believed would see a lot further down. And I've been having a lot of people ask me now that we've hit this area of support, does that mean that the meme apocalypse is over? Did we see all the downside that we're going to see on these memes? Or is there more downside yet to come? Well, what that means for you is that a coin like Doge or Chainlink that I've previously talked about or Solana that I've previously talked about that I said likely is further downside can continue to fall even if we find a bottom in this region on total, right? Because as some of these coins, right, that are that I've said are now in, in multi-month distribution tops, as they continue to bleed and fall down, they will get replaced by coins that may not be in the top 100, right? They will get replaced by coins that may be in the top 100, but that have not been performing, okay? So for example, Polkadot is a good one. Polkadot, let's take a look at the chart real quick. Polkadot chart looks like, I mean, it looks looks pretty bad. This is a chart that has not done much at all for the last few months. This is now uh, July, 2024. We are at the same price back here in July, 2022. It's been going sideways for two years. Now there's been some drama with Polkadot on the, the crypto Twitter timeline, but let's ignore that for a second and just talk about this chart here. Something that has barely moved up, you know, much at all over the last two years has been essentially going sideways, very much unlike a lot of the meme coins that I've talked about, like Doge, very much unlike Soul. These coins that have been pumping for months, right? Some coins like this, I'm not specifically talking about Dot here, but some coins that have essentially been going sideways for the last two years that theory, like essentially were giant, uh, you can say, accumulation phases at their bottoms, will start moving up, okay? Now, again, this was Dot some years ago in a giant distribution top pattern. Funnily enough, um, this pattern is the exact same structure that we are now seeing on Pepe, on the other altcoins that I previously talked about. We saw it on Bitcoin at the 65K highs. And we're seeing a lot of altcoins right now and a lot of meme coins. And I actually charted this and then used some examples uh, with Pepe and Floki, et cetera, et cetera. But this is a classic distribution top. You can see it took months to play out. And then we got this slow bleed down that lasted for months as well. And then it's been an accumulation here at these bottom at this low. This is, again, major area of demand. We know this because it's the down move before the last massive rally. So what are we doing here, right, on DOT? Again, this is not specific to DOT. This is just a technical analysis. I'm not talking about the fundamentals of DOT here. I, I don't currently hold DOT. So this is not like a specific talk about DOT, but this is just a general chart structure. Any chart that you look at, what's happening here on the higher time frames, you have a giant accumulation, markup, distribution, bleed down accumulation. What follows is markup, okay? Barring any massive fundamental issues, you would expect a chart like this to essentially grind its way back to the upside, okay? And go for another markup phase. So these charts that have been in accumulation for years now versus ones like Solana or like the meme coins that have been pumping for years, the Solana coins, the meme coins that have been pumping are essentially in this distribution phase. And I talked about this in my meme apocalypse video, which is why I expected a lot of them to start underperforming. They are the coins like DOT that were outperforming at this time. They're now in distribution phases and they'll like to continue to underperform as profits are taken and money is rotated into coins that have been in the opposite side of the spectrum. As coins like Dogecoin maybe continue to bleed, okay? Dogecoin is at 10 cents. We'll talk about it a little bit later in this video. It's at 10 cents from a high of 20 something cents where I was bearish. As coins like Doge bleed, other coins that have not been doing jack for the last year or two years will start potentially rising. 
And those increases in market cap on those coins will counteract the decreases in market cap on coins like Doge. In other words, a rotation, a rotation out of what were the top performers into coins that were not the top performers, okay? And so that rotation means that even if Pepe continues to fall, even if Doge continues to fall over the next three months, for example, our total market cap chart, that is a basket of all of them, that is like essentially an index of these coins, may very well be finding its bottom here, okay? That doesn't necessarily mean that every coin is bottom. That means that the top 100 as a whole, on average, may have bottomed, but it doesn't necessarily mean that some coins that have been in multi-month distributions have bottomed. And this is why I say that when we say, well, the alt market cut bottom is in, the dip is in, it's time to buy the dip because we're headed up. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's the case on every single altcoin. And you still need to be particular about which ones you're buying because the ones that have been in multi-month distributions are likely to continue falling from this point on, okay? They may see some balances up, but they're likely to come bleeding back down. And the ones that have been multi have been in multi-year accumulations may start to put on their massive macro bottom reversals. And this is the rotation that I was talking about when I first made my meme apocalypse video two months ago, okay? Let's go ahead and take a look at some of those coins that I talked about, how much lower they can go, progress from where I talked about initially. So let's go ahead and take a look at WIF and targets that I initially talked about in my meme apocalypse video from two months ago and where we are now, okay? So we're gonna go ahead and play a short clip from that video and we'll, we'll take it from there. In fact, what I see here is I see a very clean and clear point of breakdown. At the top of the range, you have this very clean consolidation here at the highs that ended up breaking down. And so this apex is kind of the focal point of resistance, right? So just like Bitcoin, again, I'm expecting a leg up on Bitcoin. So if we get that, you expect most alts to make another leg up as well. Where does that put us? Right in this area of resistance, which if we fail to get back above and Bitcoin does get another leg down, so will with. And the next leg down on with should take us down to at least sub 180. And realistically, just based on key levels here, where would I look at to buy with? By the way, I am interested in buying with. I'm not saying that I will never touch these coins. I think that they have a lot of future potential. I just think it's time for a cool down. Again, a lot of these have made distributive tops after clear five wave impulses off of the bottom. You can see here on with we have one, two, three, four, five for a potential local bottom or a potential buy opportunity. In other words, I'm not interested in WIF and I won't be interested in WIF and I wouldn't touch WIF in terms of a long position or a spot position until we're back at around $1.50 or a little bit below that. At that point, this is where I think we have to pay attention. This could potentially be the bottom or we could be seeing a deeper pullback. Again, down to here is about 77%. And again, 80 plus percent corrections are the norm in this space. An 80 plus percent correction would put us back under a dollar. Okay, so... That was a clip from my meme apocalypse video. And we can see here that with uh, actually retested the level that I talked about in that video uh, and bled down to sub 180, as I said in that video, and now trades at 168. Okay, a few things that I wanna point out actually. Yeah, so, so when I made that video, I had a lot of people getting upset about it, saying that I was wrong, that I was biased, whatever it may be. And here we are today at that $168 target. In that video, I said that I'd be interested in with uh, at around 168, that I'm interested in buying it there. Personally, right now, I'm not buying with just to be very, very clear. I do think that we could see some sort of a dead cat bounce here, but I don't quite think that the downside is yet done. And why do I say that, guys? Because a lot of these meme coins that I talked about, again, I, I mentioned that they're in major distribution tops and those take some time to play out, okay? Usually they're not immediate reversals if this is a multi-month distribution top, which it certainly looks like. And again, I talked about how I expect these to continue to bleed as money rotates from these coins to Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin has not yet started the next leg up to 100K, okay? It broke down from 60K. We're trading at 57K right now we still have that next major leg to the upside to happen. And I don't think that these altcoins are all gonna run up together. I think that there's gonna be rotation, okay? Altcoins, most of these meme coins have already been hit harder than other coins, and that's simply because they rose harder, so that's natural and normal. But in a multi-month distribution top like this, what you typically end up getting, and you can't see all the price history here because this goes down a lot lower and it looks a lot cleaner on the other charts like Dex Screener and Dex Tools, but what you typically end up getting after we break down here, you might even get a dead cat bounce back up, okay? I can't rule that out. But what you typically end up getting is kind of a slow choppy bleed continuation down. And then you see some sort of a base forming here and then you're ready to go up, okay? So this bleed probably continues as Bitcoin pumps. And this is what I've been saying for some time now. And a lot of people were saying that's impossible. If Bitcoin rises, the whole market rises. Guys, that is simply not the case, okay? That is not the case. If you've been here for more than a couple of years, you know that there's periods of time where there's a lack of liquidity where Bitcoin runs or where a certain sector runs and not everything runs with it. Perfect example is meme coins right now for the last six months, they've been running, not much else has been running. That profit, that has been made here will be taken and rotated to all, all coins or assets. In Bitcoin's case, it's already in a massive uptrend, but 
Bitcoin, other altcoins have not yet had major runs. We'll see rotation, okay? So what that looks like for coins like WIF is maybe some dead cat bounces, maybe some pumps, but these pumps will typically be sold into as privates are taken and rotated into something that hasn't yet pumped a thousand X, okay? Because that's where the money is to be made now. I don't necessarily think the bottom is in. We could see some bounces here, but we're there, okay? We're, we're at the first target where it actually makes sense considering buying WIF. So I considered it and decided to hold off based on market conditions, but it's at a much more attractive level here than it was 100% higher. We'll take another look at Pepe, which is the next altcoin of interest. And again, back to the video that I made uh, two months ago on the Meepocalypse. And now we're cooling off a little. And once again, we have a similar structure to what we're seeing on many of these coins across the board. Now, Pepe is a little bit different than Dog With Hat in that we do have a range here. But I think there's a chance that Pepe may go for these highs. Okay, Pepe may go for these highs here before it, it actually crashes down. Structurally, we have here on Pepe, very similar actually to what Bitcoin looked like at its 60K highs. You can see we have these series of higher highs in this sort of diagonal structure. We have a move down here. Let me go ahead and we'll take a look at Bitcoin real quick. Once again, at the macro. So this is Bitcoin and let me go and zoom out so you guys can see what I'm talking about here. And tell me this doesn't look similar, okay? So here's Bitcoin at its last 60K high. You had that three drives pattern, okay? And then you had to move back down to these lows and then you came up and took the highs that tricked everyone and then we came back down and bled, right? So Pepe is one that I can't necessarily rule out something like that playing out here to kind of solidify this top, just like most of the rest of the market thinking something like this and then a leg down. Pepe might do something like that, right? Might come back up to take these highs as Bitcoin did here at 60K, okay, before getting the more drawn out correction. Okay, so that was Pepe, guys. And you can see that's exactly what we did. Obviously, further on from that video, I had some tweets on Twitter that I shared when we were here that I expected us to make a higher low and head for the highs. We did that. We broke above the highs. A lot of people, again, mocking me, saying, you were wrong about the Meepopolis. Pepe is making new highs. And I pointed out that I actually said this was likely to happen in the, in the video, which most people ignored. But then we have now broken back down inside this range, okay? So... Again, Pepe doing exactly what I expected it to from that video. And now that we've deviated back inside the range, once again, we expect to move back down to the range lows. Obviously, we have a significant area of support here in the green zone, so we may see some sort of a bounce from there. But ultimately, where I think this is headed is lower, okay? And so, again, in a multi-month distribution top like this, they take time to play out, okay? These things typically don't reverse immediately if this is, in fact, a multi-month distribution top. If this is not, then we see a reversal of the upside and we see some sort of an impulse. And we're not seeing impulses here. This entire move was corrective, right? This move was one, two, three. This was not a five-way move. That is why I was so confident that what we're seeing here is not the start of a continuation of an uptrend, but rather a corrective move and likely a deviation above these highs, which we got, and a, a major distribution top forming here, okay? So what will change my mind? Well, if we see maybe a bottom form here, then we see a impulse, okay? We get a five wave impulse that's kind of ugly but if we get a five wave impulse uh then maybe i'm wrong and maybe this was a corrective structure and we're continuing up but i don't think that's actually the case again my expectation is that a lot of these memes are now seeing rotations out of them into other coins that have not run for a while in bitcoin of course but the point being that this is playing out exactly as expected we're now looking for a move again back down to you know below these levels here likely to close some of this inefficiency into this big cluster of demand similar to like the level that we're looking at on bitcoin right this massive cluster before the big rise. So this is like where I'm again interested in Pepe. And from current levels, that is a further 80% down. From the high, that is a 90% a down. And again, 90% drawdowns are the norm in this space. Every single coin in this space will have a 90 plus percent drawdown at some point in its lifetime. Bitcoin is at three or four now. It's not anything crazy or unrealistic. It's very, very logical and realistic. Coins like Pepe, a lot of these meme coins have not had 90% drawdowns yet. So one is due. Whether that be now or later is up to you know, what you think is happening right now. I think it's probably, we're probably in the middle of it, but maybe we go higher and then get it. But at some point we're going to get it, okay? And based on everything that I've said in that video from two months ago, and what I'm showing you guys now, my belief is that that move has probably started, okay? With that being said, because I know it's going to happen, at some point we're going to get some relief to the upside and you're going to get a bunch of people coming out of the woodwork saying I was wrong. I'm not saying that we can't bounce at some point, guys. I'm not saying that we can't head a bit higher, but until we print a clean impulse, this is ultimately what's going to end up happening, in my opinion, okay? Unless we print a new impulsive move to the upside. So again, that's Pepe. Let's go ahead and take a look at Doge. Okay, Doge, I'm not going to go and play the, the, the clip from the 
video. Okay, we're just gonna again show you this was my short zone from that video from two months ago. Again, once again, people in disbelief saying it's impossible, calling for a dollar. We've now bled all the way back down to my first target from that video. You guys can go back and check, take a look at it if you want, sub 10 cents, okay? And in that video, I said two things. I said either sub 10 cents is our bottom, which is the zone here, or we're probably gonna see sub five cents, okay? Everyone who disagreed with me then, who thought it was impossible, should now be taking a look at the chart and understanding that it's very, 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 very possible, okay? Again, zooming out, we take the same, take the same idea, the same logic about corrections, right? You consider this as one giant five wave move, one giant impulse, a logical retracement here, again, 20 to 30% easy, 50% totally fine. What does 50% put us at? Puts us at four cents, okay? Certainly possible, certainly possible. And again, like I've said, while I think Bitcoin is near its bottom, I don't think that these coins have bottomed. I think most of these are forming, you know, higher time frame distribution tops like Doge here, consolidated, broke out, fake out to the upside, probably going to come down and take these lows. Again, that that doesn't mean that Bitcoin is going to continue to bleed down to 30K over the next three months. I think Bitcoin is getting close to reversal to the upside. That doesn't necessarily mean that every coin will see reversal along with Bitcoin. And that is where I think coins like Doge may see some relief to the upside. We've hit our first downside target area of demand, logical place to see a bounce. We probably see a bounce, okay, along with Bitcoin. And then we probably find some resistance and then continue to bleed as Bitcoin continues to pump, okay? And that is where we get this sort of prolonged bleed to the downside on a lot of these coins as Bitcoin continues up to 100K plus. And again, a lot of people in disbelief that this could even happen and are still in dis disbelief that this could happen while Bitcoin pumps. It certainly can. Let me be very clear about that. The structure on Bitcoin is very, very different from a lot of these altcoins. Bitcoin with clear impulsive five-way moves to the upside, clear trending price action. A lot of these altcoins stuck in ranges with choppy price action, deviations above the highs and the lows, three-legged moves to the upside. This is not impulsive price action. You can't expect a non-trending asset to behave like a trending asset. Bitcoin is trending on the high time frames, no question about it. A lot of these alts are not. So you can't expect them to run with Bitcoin as if they are trending because they're not yet. And so what's going to happen is as people realize the weakness in all of these coins, they start moving money to the trending assets like Bitcoin. And that's where you get the major rotation occurring. So again, Dogecoin, logical place to be interested at 10 cents, but there's a chance that we can go lower if this region is lost. We may certainly see a bounce here. And I don't really have any plans right now to short this thing until I get a clear area of interest to short. Right now, I'm thinking that just to give you guys an idea, and it's not a concrete idea yet. I haven't set any orders or anything of that nature yet, but assuming that Bitcoin is going to reverse soon, we could see something like if Bitcoin gets to the leg down, could see another push into here, and then we maybe see reversal, some relief to take all these highs, take these local highs up in here, and then we may see another distribution, lower time frame, and then another further bleed down. If the opportunity presents itself, I would love to short doge again i don't know if i'll get that opportunity but i'm looking for something like this to play out okay some sort of a relief to take some liquidity to the upside and provide for a nice risk reward short back down to my lower targets okay it's also possible again depending on how bitcoin acts here in the coming weeks and depending on how low it goes that we bleed further than this and maybe we just simply bleed down to these levels sooner rather than later maybe we don't get such a relief rally i really don't know until it depends on what bitcoin does okay and so maybe we bleed down further and then maybe we get some relief and then maybe we, you know, I, I don't know how it's going to play out exactly. The point is that I'm not going to blindly short this thing. If I get a nice trade setup, then I'll take it. Until then, we're, we're patient and we're waiting. So that was Doge. So pretty much uh, everything that I talked about in that Mean Publix video from two, two months was playing out. There was a trade on Matic that I described that I took, which I got stopped out on. Okay. And again, that I mentioned that in my last video update. It was uh, a very simple trade. We had a stop loss at this invalidation. It got hit so that I've been stopped out of that trade. And now I'm once again, not interested in logging Matic. That was a simple trade where if this really was our bottom, there was a chance then we had a very high risk reward ratio leg for the move to the upside. We've hit that invalidation, which means that our bottom has not yet been found on Matic. And so again, now I'm just looking for the, the usual. I'm looking for some sort of an impulsive move to the upside to indicate that we have a bottom. Uh, what I am looking for on Matic, for example, now would be, are we forming a larger range here? Do you have these lows that I'm looking at? If we bleed a little bit lower, maybe form a larger base and then impulse. Okay. So Matic may take some time now to complete what could be a larger accumulation range, for example. That's just a very rough example. Or maybe this was just a quick wick of this low. And now maybe we form a reversal. Either way, we should see a nice impulsive move to start to kick off the run. So that's what I'll be looking for on a coin like Matic. Uh, let's talk about Ethereum real quick. Here is my Ethereum chart. You can see here that the Ethereum chart kind of looks like the Bitcoin chart in terms of that massive area of demand that we have. 
I'll give you one key difference here, uh, which I'll talk about here in a second. But let me just pull up the Bitcoin chart. So this is the Bitcoin chart. This is the Ethereum chart. And where do I think Ethereum will bottom? I'm looking at the green zone, this high time frame zone between 2200 to 2700. Very, very similar to our high time frame zone here on Bitcoin. Okay. So you can kind of consider these zones to be similar in terms of context. Okay. If, if this zone here on Bitcoin between 38K to 49K is our massive high time frame support, then this zone here uh, at 22K to 27K is our massive high time frame support on Ethereum. Okay. Two things I want to point out. Ethereum, a lot of hype about the EZF, a lot of hype about, you know, all, all the narratives and stuff going on. And I've previously said that I don't expect Ethereum Bitcoin is going to bottom until Bitcoin completes, you know, its, its next leg. And I stand by that. So I don't think Ethereum Bitcoin has bottomed yet. We'll take a look at that chart here in a second. But I want to point out something very uh, important here. Okay. You'll notice that structure, while these levels are the same here on Bitcoin and Ethereum, there's two key differences. Okay. Two significant differences about these charts. Well, they, even though they look quite similar. Okay. The first is that for, for Bitcoin, we have this major area of demand and support, but right above it, we have this smaller area of demand which is still significant because you can see how quickly we accelerated off of it after consolidating here for a number of days. This is a very key area of support that stands in front of the level that probably everyone's looking at. On Ethereum, we don't quite have such a level. Okay, Ethereum has already hit this area of demand one, two, three times. Bitcoin has not yet hit this level. It's common when you have an asset like Bitcoin that is showing a lot of strength or that has a lot of strength anticipated for the next leg that it doesn't correct as necessarily as aggressively or deeply as some of its counterparts. I also want to point out that while Bitcoin has had a very clear impulsive structure, literally since 15K with the clean five wave moves that we've obviously identified, specifically even this one here, very, very clean five wave impulsive price action, Ethereum hasn't, okay? Ethereum's moves up, moves up have been kind of ugly, drawn out, kind of almost like forced grinds to the upside not the strong and clear impulsive price action we've seen on Bitcoin. Even this last move that we had as an impulse on, on a Bitcoin here was more of a quick spike on Ethereum, almost in one candle. It wasn't a clear five wave, nice subdivided impulse. It was more of a one, two, three, a very aggressive move that obviously is not fully retraced. But there's a difference here in the structures of Bitcoin and Ethereum on the higher time frames. And there's a difference here in the areas of support and demand on these coins in the higher time frames. With that being said, it would not surprise me to see Ethereum leg into that high time frame area of demand and see Bitcoin potentially front run it. Okay. That would not surprise me. I think it's almost, I don't want to say guaranteed, but I think it's highly, highly likely that Ethereum taps 2200 to 2700. I don't necessarily feel as confident about Bitcoin tapping 49K to 38K. I think there's a decent chance that Ethereum taps this zone, but Bitcoin front runs it and only hits this cluster of demand right below us. And that is just a further attestation to the strength of Bitcoin and for what's coming. The next leg up on Bitcoin, again, massive impulse to the upside, 100K plus. Same can't necessarily be said for Ethereum because you don't quite yet have very clear impulsive price action. Now we'll take a look at Ethereum and Ethereum Bitcoin. And something like Ethereum Again, the old highs on Ethereum are right here at 4,900. And obviously our old highs on Bitcoin have already been hit and Bitcoin has been chopping around there for three months now. So something like Ethereum, I can see kind of hitting this area of demand, then popping up into new all-time highs and then potentially rejecting here and chopping around the same way that Bitcoin did. Bitcoin chopped around here after hitting new highs for about three months, okay? It's logical then to think that there's a chance that Ethereum hits this resistance. There's some profit taking as money shifts into Bitcoin for the parabolic leg to 100K plus, all attention's on Bitcoin. And Ethereum chops about here before, before following Bitcoin, okay? And what that means is, on the Ethereum Bitcoin chart, is that we see continued underperformance on Ethereum. And again, I said now, it's literally since these highs here at 0.08 Ethereum Bitcoin over a year ago, that we're going to see drawdown to this area here, and then more specifically, this area here, okay? I've said this literally over a year ago. We're down over 50% from that level. And I have a lot of people that are very tempted to call a bottom on Ethereum Bitcoin. With the structure that we're seeing here on the Ethereum USD chart versus the Bitcoin USD chart, I don't think the bottom is in. I think we're headed lower, okay? And again, this is the ideal area for us to go down to, about 0.03 Ethereum Bitcoin, okay? 
And this move down likely happens as Bitcoin continues out of this correction into an impulsive trending move to 100,000 plus, while Ethereum initially follows it or leads it even, and then probably rejects or stutters or consolidates at prior highs, doesn't quite impulse out of this uh, resistance and kind of chops about. That sends this pairing down as Bitcoin's continuing to impulse, Ethereum's struggling a little bit. And then when we hit this area, then I think we then see Ethereum break out, follow Bitcoin to the upside, ultimately outperforming it and heading to new highs on the Ethereum Bitcoin pairing, okay? New highs. I think we're ultimately headed here, but first I think we're headed lower, okay? So that is Ethereum for some context. And that kind of wraps up, I think, uh, the altcoin market, Bitcoin market, Ethereum majors, how some altcoins may be bottoming, how some altcoins are probably going to bleed for the coming months. So long story short, guys, when I get questions about is the meme apocalypse over, the meme apocalypse is not over, in my opinion. We're, we're, well, we're well within it. We may see some relief, but I do think that those coins that I talked about are going to continue to bleed for some time. Again, there will always be some exceptions. There will always be some coins that may outperform, but as a whole, that sector, I think, has seen its light for, for now, has some more time to bleed, and may eventually recover towards the end of the cycle, maybe after Bitcoin tops and we see another mega rally. But I think the focus is now shifting away from memes. As I said two months ago, we're well within that period now. And I think it only continues for some more months. And the attention should now be on those coins that have not been running for months because the attention will start to shift to them as they pump. Another thing that I want to kind of talk about the logic behind People ask me, well, if, if coins like Solana, for example, I think Solana, I, I called for, you know, sub 115th, the minimum, probably going to go down to sub 100. People ask me, well, if a coin like Solana is going to fall another 50% from where we are now, then does that mean that coins like CRV, which has been down in the dumps, CRV is at all time lows. Does that mean a coin like CRV is going to fall another 50%? And then this is kind of where I did, did make the distinction between all coins that I'm talking about. Guys, just because your meme coin is going to fall 50 to 70% from current levels does not mean that every coin is going to fall 50 to 70% from current levels, right? The key is a coin like Solana or your meme coins that have pumped thousands of percent over the last six months, there is a lot of money to be made that, are, that has been made and um, there will be profit taking, okay? As these coins fall and people who have bought at these highs see their money dwindling, they will capitulate. They will then sell at a loss. Some will take profits, some will sell at a loss. That sell pressure is substantial, will be substantial because you have a lot of people that are now underwater probably after buying the highs. And as we bleed lower, emotions take over and they panic sell. Or or people who are in profit from way lower because there are a lot of those guys too who will start taking profits as they realize that, okay, maybe we have seen an interim top. So just because Solana is due for another 50% correction of the downside doesn't mean that your coin that has done you know, jack squat for the last six months is going to fall 50% too. Okay, Odds are that that coin, like let's just take CRV as an example, Odds are that that coin like CRV that is down at the lows, okay, who's left here holding CRV? No one, no one's in profit. <laughs> no one's in profit on CRV. I'm not in profit on CRV. I'm certainly in, in a major loss right now. It doesn't matter to me because I think we're at a much higher in the mid to long term. But if you're still holding CRV here, you actually believe in the protocol. You actually believe in what's happening. You believe that it's headed much higher. You're not tempted to sell at these lows. I certainly am not. And they never have been. But my point is that there's no profits to be taken here, right? There's no one underwater either. Pretty much everyone who bought here is pretty much in profit or they've already sold at a loss, okay? So the sell pressure here, there's not much. There should not be much relative to something like Solana that there's a lot of people that are either in profit or going to take profits. A lot of people that are that are underwater now who are going to capitulate. Everyone in CRV who didn't believe in the product protocol who had low conviction has now capitulated or has taken profits, okay? So the only direction, for lack of a better word, is up, okay? We could certainly go lower. We can't go lower than zero, so we can only go so much lower. Uh, let's go ahead and quickly talk about HBAR only because I get so many requests for it. I haven't been updating it because there's not much to talk about. But let's just go ahead and give it a quick look. HBARbarians, I see you in the comments. And so let's go ahead and talk about HBAR real quick. And then we'll wrap this up if for all coins. And we'll go on to the conclusion of this video, which will be covering some of the questions that you guys have. Let's go ahead and take a look at HBAR. Here's HBAR, okay? I, I get another question about HBAR. People saying, oh, well, HBAR, if, if Solana is falling down to 50%, then HBAR is going to three cents, okay? Could it go to three cents? Yeah. Do I think it's going to three cents? No. Okay. H bar, I'll show you guys a level that I'm watching now. Obviously, this is a key area that I marked off previously. We've tested it now though four times. And the more that these levels get tested, the technically the weaker they get. So if you are looking to buy some H bar, where would I look in case this level is lost, in case Bitcoin falls lower? Um, let me go ahead and you can go to the higher time frame chart here. Let's go to the monthly. 
and this is the level that I'd be looking at. If this if this green level is lost, you might get you might catch a wick into this level. Let me put it that way. This level right here, kind of this monthly consolidation. We have a little bit of an inefficiency here. Okay, we already got a wick into that inefficiency, so that may be all we get. But maybe we get one more wick if Bitcoin continues down. Maybe we get one more wick and you get a chance at some five cent H bar. From current levels, that's about twenty to twenty five percent lower. Okay, and this kind of puts things into perspective. If you think, if I think a meme like Pepe is still due for seventy percent more downside. I don't think the same for coins like HVR, CRV that have not done much, right? For those, I think, okay, maybe 25, 30% more downside. And so again, the downside pretty much continues on all alts as Bitcoin is bleeding. But when Bitcoin reverses, some alts will reverse, some alts will continue to bleed. That's where the big difference is. And those alts that have been in multi-month distributions will continue to bleed, in my opinion. Those alts that have not been pumping much at all and are rather an accumulation rather than distribution. Again, something like HBAR was, in hindsight, we can see now clearly in distribution at these highs but is now in accumulation at these lows. And again, this is a great example of a chart that just like DOT, just like what I showed you guys on DOT, let me go ahead and zoom in a little bit. What are we looking at? We're looking at the previous accumulation zone, cluster of demand, accumulation, over here, distribution, right? Your meme coins, again, this is, looks almost identical to the DOT chart, which kind of shows you guys that this isn't really a game about fundamentals right now. It's more technicals and, and speculation, but this, was, this is where most of your meme coins are at or breaking down now. Again, this is just like Pepe. This is actually, this is perfect. Look at this, guys. This is exactly what coins like Pepe are doing right now, right? We had that deviation above the highs, right? We had the deviation above the highs. We had the break back inside the range. And I'm looking for what? I'm looking for a bleed down, like on Pepe, down to these lows. Same thing. HBAR did that months ago. Bitcoin did that months ago, right? This is where Pepe is right now, in my opinion. This is where we're headed for Pepe. This is where most meme coins are, in my opinion. And this is where we're headed for most of them. On the other side of the spectrum, this is where most of the coins that already saw distribution years ago have been in accumulation for years. And these coins that have been in accumulation for years have less downside potential than those coins that are currently in distribution. And the coins that are in accumulation have a higher risk reward for going up. Simple as that, guys. A rotation. A rotation from the guys that are taking profits here into coins that are down here. People ask me, why would I rotate into something that's down 90%? Well, you loved your 1,000x gains on Soul <laughs> and on meme coins by buying here and selling here. Guess what? Those guys who've made 1,000x, they want to make another 1,000x by buying here and selling here. It's simple as that. It's a rotational game. Fundamentals matter to some extent, but to some extent right now, it's speculation that matters more. And if I made 1,000x on my meme coin and I can take profits and now make 1,000x on some fundamentally strong coin that has been down for the last two years that pays me real revenue based off of actual revenue generated in, in CRV, then guess what? I'm going to do that. It makes sense to do that. And I'm going to make another thousand X here. So it's people want to make money, right? In where, wherever they can make it. It's, it's kind of funny though, because people talk about how no one wants data coins. No, no one cares about fundamentals. It's only meme coins. Meme coins are the only thing that matters. And then I ask them why? Well, because people want to make money, right? They don't care about fundamentals. They want to make money. Well, if I wanted to make money, I didn't care about fundamentals. I have a lot better chance of making money off a chart that looks like this. That has a lot of upside potential versus a chart that looks like this. That's already pumped up a thousand percent. If I want to make money and that's all I care about, I'm looking at coins that have now moved into multi-year accumulation zones versus coins that are way higher, right? This is what I want to buy. This is where I want to buy. This is where I want to sell. Obviously, in hindsight, it's easier, but this is where I'm interested in buying. So if it's just about money and if it's not about fundamentals, then forget the fundamentals and look at the technicals. And this is where you want to be buying coins, not up here, okay? If it's just about the money, then this is a much better buy than a lot of those coins that have pumped thousands of percent. It's kind of like you're answering your own question. Why are people going to buy these coins? Well, because they want to make money and these offer you a lot more potential to make money than coins that have already pumped thousands of percent. So with that being said, guys, that pretty much covers, I think, the entire market at this point. You guys should have a good idea of where I think we're headed. Let's go ahead and take a look now at some of the questions that I've got on Twitter. Okay, guys, here is the post. 309 likes. We have 141 comments. I'm going to go down this and see if I can answer some of the most significant or pertinent questions. I might go to the charts for some of these. I might just respond to them immediately, depending on how complex they get. And yeah, we'll just answer as many of these things as I can that I think are worth answering. Digital Shin, please include analysis on Bitcoin dominance. I'm just going to tell you without having to show you guys a chart, I think it's going higher. Again, if Bitcoin is getting that parabolic leg blow off top, dominance is going to spike on a blow off top, on a parabolic advance. It's going to spike temporarily, right? Bitcoin dominance is headed higher. Eventually it's going to top. Once it tops and all start following Bitcoin up, Bitcoin dominance is going to fall. Where do I think it's going to fall? Currently, it's at around 50, 50 to 60%. I think it's going a little bit higher, of course, but I think it's ultimately going to end up sub 30%, right? Bitcoin dominance is going to continue to pump until it peaks. And then as alts catch up after Bitcoin tops, dominance is going to tank. Where do I think it's going to tank? 
to levels lower than it did in 2017. That means sub 30% Bitcoin dominance, but that comes after we go for, we go higher. Okay. Next question. Is this the final fifth wave up? Do you think our current sub wave four correction will last longer than our sub wave two correction did? Good question. The sub wave four correction technically has already lasted longer. Let me explain to you guys why real quick. This is a good one, actually. Kind of talks about the nuances of wave structure here. So let's go ahead and take a quick look. So the question was, will our wave four last longer than our wave two? And this is important because technically it already has, okay? And, and why I say that is because our wave two that happened here, I know some are counting it, again, this whole thing as the wave two, but we know again that this was actually an impulsive move and it was part of this larger third. And so the wave two actually was just uh, this little area of time here, which it, are, it took about 61 days to play out. And our wave four we know is this entire structure now, right? So that was 60 days, right? The wave four thus far has taken 120 days to play out. So yes, our wave four is longer than our wave two. And what's interesting, actually, if this was actually our bottom, which it, again, like I said earlier in the video, it very well could have been if we didn't see that substantial sell pressure come in, which was unexpected, then if this was our bottom, our wave four would have actually been very similar in length to our wave two, about 60 days. And again, that's perfect. That's again, I talk about how you should see some sort of a relationship between the corrective waves in terms of time and price. That's a great example, right? Had this level not been broken, we were probably ready to move up until the sell pressure came in and we would have matched the wave two in terms of length of correction almost exactly. So now it's obviously longer and now that we've broken the the lows of 60K. So this wave four is now stretched out a little bit longer. It is now, I want to say, we said, what, about 120 days long, about two times the length of the wave two, which is fine. Normally anything up to three times is, is okay. Anything above three times in terms of time, you have to start questioning if they're of the same degree, but thus far it's about two times as long. So the question was, macro wave four took way longer to play out than corrective wave two. In this final fifth wave up, do you think our current sub wave four correction will last longer than our sub wave two correction did? It already has. It's already been about twice as long, which matches actually the fact that our macro wave four took longer than our wave two, right? So yeah, looks that actually lines up pretty well. What would make you change your stance on meme coins drawing down even further? And so while you're at it, I want to see an impulse. We have no impulsive price action. Until we get a pulse of price action, I assume we're going lower. What would make you think the market has stopped like for years? Bitcoin at 30K, not going to happen in my opinion. Okay, but that is what it would take for me to think that the market has stopped. Do you think bottom is in? I addressed that in the video. Uh, not necessarily. We haven't seen an impulse on Bitcoin, but we should be close. This is a good one. Lose 38 to 40K cycle pretty much over, question mark. Uh, for Bitcoin, that would be pretty bad. Yeah, uh, pretty bad. Why do you see so much more downside to come for alts? I mean, technically allowed, didn't it? did I say technically allowed to go below 38 to 40K, but Again, we don't want to see the same way that we had our, on the higher macro, we couldn't see wave four, this big wave go into wave one here at 13.8K, which we didn't. 14K, that 14K level I've been talking about for years. That applies here too. So technically, uh, the wave four should not go below 32K, but even 38K, a 38 to 40K, really, 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 really unlikely. So that's that. Uh, why do I see so much more down to come for alts when we had like the Ethereum ETF just about to launch? Seems like a solid momentum reignite or no. Again, Bitcoin has been showing very clear macro impulses off of 15K, very clear trending environments since 15K. Most of these alts haven't. Most of these alts are, have been in corrective waves. Most of these alts are now in distribution phases, different structures altogether on the charts. Price targets and timeframes like you always do, HBAR, CRBC. All my price targets that I've been talking about for literally years, guys, have been for a Bitcoin after a Bitcoin top. After Bitcoin tops for this cycle, after the fifth wave is complete, after Bitcoin is above 100K, that is when all those cycle targets come into play. I have people that are like, you said that HBAR is going to a dollar plus in 2021. It's not there. You were wrong. I said in 2021 that HBAR will see a dollar plus, two to five dollars is my target by the end of the cycle after Bitcoin has stopped, after Bitcoin has seen its fifth wave above 100K. We're not there yet. So all those people saying that you're wrong are, are saying it prematurely. That, that applies for CRV. That applies for CVAX. That applies for every coin that I've pretty much ever talked about in terms of cycle targets. I've always said post Bitcoin top, we're not there yet. Once Bitcoin tops it above 100K, then we're there. Then these coins see their massive pumps, like I've always said. Then we hit those targets that I've talked about. So we have a while to go before those targets are met. And nothing has changed and nothing will change about my targets because those targets were not based on lower time frame price action. They're based on higher time frame ideas. Let's see what else. Can you touch on how to manage trading during parents like we saw? June drawdown. Most people kept buying the dip and the trend clearly changed. Current consolidation or price is more choppy. Again, if you're trading, you need to have strict invalidation and you need to manage risk. How to manage trading? June drawdown, most kept buying the dip, the trend changed. Again, 
as long as you have that impulsive price action, you're buying the dip, you're setting a stop loss. When it hits and gets invalidated, you're out of the trade, you take the loss, you move on, you look for the next setup. Simple. If you don't have a clear setup like we do now, we don't have a clear impulse. You're not buying this dip without a clear validation. We could go to 53K. We could go to 50K. I've talked about how we could go to sub 50K. That means you don't have a clear validation. That means if you're trading, you don't take a trade. You only take a trade when you have a clear idea, a clear invalidation like we had here. That's why I took this trade. I got stopped out. I lost some money. It is what it is. Trading is not a 100% success rate. You take every shot, you miss a portion of those shots, just like in every every game in this world. It's not a 100% hit rate. It never is. When you don't have a shot right here, you don't take the shot. When you don't have a clear setup, you don't take it. So you wait for a setup to present itself. You wait for a clear level of validation, and then you take a trade. If you're just buying spot and your dollar cost averaging down, you have more flexibility. You don't have to worry about buying and selling on the validation. So like if I was buying spot here around 63, 65K, thinking I'm getting my next fifth leg, then it doesn't matter to me that 60K broke. It doesn't matter to me that we might see 53K. It doesn't matter to me that we might see 50K because I know that what follows all of this is going to be another massive leg to 100K plus. So if I'm buying spot and I'm not trading, I'm just investing, then to me, this doesn't matter. And I don't do anything. I just keep DCAing in. Again, not financial advice, but that's my approach as an investor. Let's see what else... The obvious one, all-time high this year. Yes, again, as I've said, once this correction ends, we probably move up $30,000 within the span of a month. We still have August, September, October, November, December, six months of the year left. Absolutely all-time highs this year. Cycle top this year, yeah, no change. Do you think this cycle is similar to 2016, 2017, or more like 2020? This is the same cycle that we've been in since 2018. 2016, 2017 was the end of our last cycle. 2020, from 2018 to 2020 was not a full cycle. That was this cycle that we're in now. We're still in that same cycle in 2024. This cycle has been going on since 2018, since Bitcoin's at 3K. So this cycle is not like 2020 because this is the same cycle as 2020. No question. Just want to thank you for your time and effort you put in. You've seriously helped countless people learn an abundance of information. Appreciate that. Fish shark, fish shark, fish shark. Appreciate that. Appreciate all the support, guys, and the comments like this. I notice them even if I don't respond. Uh, and I really appreciate all the support. Will CRV pump soon? What's a level would indicate a reversal? Good question on CRV. I just want to touch on that because I didn't touch on it earlier in the video and kind of emphasize here that you need to not focus on our time organization unless, unless you're actively trading. But a lot of people, as we're bleeding down here and as we continue to bleed down here, we're freaking out because they were saying that why is CRV bleeding when the rest of the market is not falling? This was before I think Bitcoin made the most recent drop. And they were looking at the weakness on Bitcoin and they're getting kind of flustered with CRV because they're saying CRV is bleeding when Bitcoin's not. So here's the hourly chart. And you can see here that CRV actually came and made a lower low here when a lot of alts have made higher lows. But you can see here from this low onwards, right? If I just go ahead and mark this off. It's about right here on Bitcoin. CRV has been outperforming Bitcoin to the upside. It's gotten back above these highs. When we were at these highs, Bitcoin is right over here. So Bitcoin was right here. Okay, when CRV was right here, and now CRV is back above that level, Bitcoin's way below. Okay, and again, this is just simply to say, don't worry about the slow time frame price action on CRV. If you got freaked out and panic sold, you sold the bottom. CRV is now performing Bitcoin at least in the short term, and you left CRV list. Okay, so my point being, don't worry too much about the slow time frame PA. People ask how much lower can we go? It doesn't matter because we're not going to zero, and we're at twenty cents off of a high of six dollars, guys. The upside potential is massive. We're going to bottom somewhere between now and zero. It has to happen. And then we're going to head dollars higher. So don't get caught up in the Zorg type from stuff. Unless you're actively trading, you can look for setups like I did. That's fine. Strict invalidation, put your stop losses where they need to be. Try and catch a trade. That's fine. If you're buying investing spot, stop freaking out about these movements in low time frame. They're just going to shake you out. Fundamentally, things have only gotten better for CRV. I'm not going to get too much into that, but emissions drop in August from, I think it's like 16% down to 8% things are only getting better for CRV. Fees, fee revenue is, is off the charts right now. APR for staking CVX CRV is like 30% right now. They're all positive fundamental developments. So ignore the low time price action. And I don't know how much lower we're going to go. We could certainly go back below 21K. We barely wicked below it here. It's hard to see, but we barely wicked below it. We did quite, we did technically wick below, I think. But I call this like a double bottom. So could we go lower? Yeah, maybe we get one more wick down like that. Can't rule it out, but... Don't even don't even worry about this. Any if you're confident in CRV, this is a chance to buy more. Since all bled so hard prior to the Bitcoin leg up, do you still envision Bitcoin sucking the liquidity of alts even further as Bitcoin eventually climbs sometime this year? Wouldn't that just massacre the entire alt market for good? This question is important. It's basically what I covered in the entire video. Yes, but some alts, not all, right? 
the alts that are now in distribution tops, the alts that I've been pumping for six months, those alts are the ones that Bitcoin's going to suck liquidity out of, right? Doesn't mean it's going to be for every alt. Some alts that have been in accumulation are going to bottom and they're going to start moving up. Other alt coins are going to bleed. Doge, still going to revisit 0.06, 0.05 from here. Talked about that. We may get some dead cat bounces from here. We've hit my first area of interest. Could be a full and reversal from current levels. But yeah, still possible that we visit 0.05 to 0.06. A good question. In the last year or two, I don't believe you've analyzed the highest alpha leverage options for the US users, unable to access Bybit, MEX, et cetera, with Bit, Bitex and Bitto having their own issues, dividends, fees. Is there anything else you'd consider as a decent proxy? You can buy as a US user, you can buy Bitcoin options on interactive brokers, which allows you to buy CME Bitcoin options. You don't have to worry about dividends on, on something like that. Uh, unfortunately, with that, you can only trade them during business or during market hours, traditional market hours, which is not the full week and limited hours per day, which is not ideal because if we have a pump during after hours, you can't trade, you can't sell. So not ideal. You're better off going with a decentralized options exchange, of which there's quite a few here. I personally like to use one called Syncquote. And link is link is not in my bio for that one, but I'll probably add it there soon. I do have a ref link for that as well, which you guys are free to use, but that's what I personally use is decentralized and it's Bitcoin options and allows you to trade Bitcoin options just like you can buy on the CME exchange, but a lot better liquidity and you can trade them 24 seven, 365. All right. Next question. I saw your shilling curve for two years. It's been down only since aside from liquidations and revenue generation. How do you still have any faith that it will hit $6? Great question. So a few things, guys, the reason that you've seen me shilling it for two years is because Unlike most people here, my long-term investments are based primarily in fundamentals. I'll trade anything that moves, including meme coins, and plenty of instances where I showed on Twitter, I have both long and shorted meme coins. But in terms of my actual investments or my longer-term holds, they're all based on fundamentals. Why? Because exactly for this reason, I can, I can weather the drawdown. It doesn't concern me because I understand that there's fundamentals behind the coin, that if, if it doesn't rise tomorrow, it'll rise the day after. Eventually, it's going to rise because the fundamentals give it some reason to actually rise. And so, number one, I, I, I don't the reason I've been showing for two years is because unlike most in this space, I'm not just chasing the next pump and dump. I'm not promoting meme coins that I get paid to do so. And that's why you hear me talking about the same coins for the last two years, because I'm not here to, to show you guys, as they, as they say, show you guys the flavor of the day to make a quick buck. Any coin that I talk about, I'm doing so based off of for most likely fundamental reasons. And so I've always said these are longer term investments. These are not shorter term plays. And that's why it doesn't bother me. That's why I still talk about these coins today, because fundamentally, on these coins, nothing has changed. I mean, I know that it's a matter of time before they rise again. Why do I have faith that it'll hit $6? Because from the time that it hit $6 till now, fundamentals have only gotten stronger. Nothing has changed to make me think that things have gotten worse than $6. And if it's hit $6 with the fundamentals that I had back then, it will certainly hit them again with the fundamentals as today. And again, this kind of proves my point. People are like, hey, you're being paid by Curve or you're being paid by HBAR Foundation. Guys, no one's paying me anything to talk about these coins. If I was being paid to talk about coins, you'd be hearing a new coin coming out of my mouth every single day like some of these guys on Twitter. You'd be hearing me talk about meme coins all the time. I get offers every single day for thousands of coins. The reason you keep hearing about the same coins from me for the last two years is because I don't accept these paid shills and I'm not interested in collecting a quick buck to talk about a coin. I'm interested in talking about the coins that I believe in. If you don't believe in them, that's fine. I have no problem with that. I'm not forcing you to buy them. That's the reason I, that you're hearing me talk about the same coins for years, because I believe in the fundamentals. Okay, next question. If Bitcoin slowly grinds up to about 90 to 100 can fizzles out, will that look like a cycle top, especially if Bitcoin dominance starts dropping alongside? Key to remember here, guys, is that the next leg up on Bitcoin will be, in my opinion, the final leg before a cycle top, okay? So when Bitcoin does eventually fizzle out after this next leg to the upside, then yes, it will be the cycle top. With that being said, just like we saw five waves up very clearly, in fact, on this last subwave of the, of the third wave, or even from these lows, or even from these lows, the next leg up should have a series of higher highs and higher lows. It should be a five wave move to the upside. It should be a trending move, which means at the very, very minimum, you're looking for five waves up. Okay. So if we get to 100K, this is actually a great way to look at it. If we get to 100K and all we have thus far is is one major leg to the upside or three legs to the upside. We're missing this fourth and the fifth. If this is where we're at, at 100K, for example, then no, this is not the end of the move. You're looking for a fourth wave and then a fifth wave. And then as we've completed one, two, three, four, and we're starting the fifth, then you want to be cautious about a potential top, okay? Because wherever this fifth ends, okay, whether that be at 130K or 160K or 200K, wherever that fifth wave ends, that is going to mark our cycle top, okay? That is going to mark not just our top for the move from 15K 
to 100 and whatever K, it's going to mark the entire cycle top from our move from 3K. Okay. That means that this cycle has started in 2018 at 3K now for the first time in six years has completed. And what will follow again is going to be a massive, massive bear market in my opinion, akin to the dot com bust. That is going to be a lot more violent than people are expecting. And we'll cover that in another future YouTube video. But that is when you can worry about a potential top. When we start working on this final fifth of the fifth. Until then, it's too early. How can you simultaneously be bullish on the total three chart and bearish on Solana, Sol Eth, and BNB make the basket? Make that basket. And Ethereum looks like it's on death's doorstep. Very open to your rationale. So this isn't me coming at you. Very curious what you're seeing with the Sol chart. I pretty much addressed this in the video, guys. I hope that this question is already answered. I think I pretty much covered it in the video. That was one of the main topics that I wanted to cover because I get this question a lot. How can you simultaneously be bullish on Bitcoin but bearish on X alt or Y alt or Z alt? And I think I've pretty much made that very clear in this video. So hopefully that question is answered. That was one of the main points that I wanted to kind of answer with this video. Okay, another good question. Great work. Can you comment on the massive divergence between the NASDAQ and Bitcoin that has developed recently? Thanks in advance. Let's take a quick look at that. I haven't actually looked at the NASDAQ chart recently, but I have a feeling. Okay, so this is what they're talking about. This big rise on the NASDAQ while Bitcoin has been going sideways. Let me show you guys something real quick because I think a lot of people mistakenly try and compare these two. And when they see one running without the other, when they see the NASDAQ running without Bitcoin, they think that it's weakness on Bitcoin's part and that Bitcoin is doomed. <laughs> so let's take a quick look at this real quick. I'm going to go to the daily chart on both of these. I'm going to mark off something here. Okay. We're going to mark off the low here on Bitcoin. And I'm going to mark off that same low here on the SBX. Okay. So this low was January 23rd. Here's January 23rd on the SBX. What I want to show you guys here is even at this time, because I remember very clearly when Bitcoin was consolidating here, actually it even happened further back down at these lows, but Bitcoin was consolidating here. This is where it was. Okay. We had the NASDAQ running up from April 14th to July 23rd. Okay. In that same time from April 14th to June 17th, Bitcoin is trending down. And a lot of people saw this as a sign of a tons of weakness on Bitcoin. Bitcoin's bleeding down. NASDAQ is going up. While the NASDAQ went sideways, Bitcoin saw a massive rally. NASDAQ went sideways for from January 19th to May, January, February, May, three months. In that same time, Bitcoin went up 74% while NASDAQ moved sideways. Okay. Now NASDAQ is moving up and Bitcoin has moved sideways. This is, these are not always going to be directly correlated, guys. Literally, NASDAQ went sideways for three months while Bitcoin ripped. Do not assume that because the NASDAQ is moving up right now and Bitcoin is consolidating, that this is some massive sign of weakness and that Bitcoin is due. Too many people try and correlate these things to each other. When NASDAQ moves up, Bitcoin must move up. When NASDAQ is not moving up, Bitcoin should not move up. If NASDAQ is moving up and Bitcoin is not, it's weak. That's what people thought down here. And then Bitcoin ripped 70% while NASDAQ went sideways. These don't have to be correlated. And oftentimes they are not. But you get a lot of people trying to draw correlations between the two. And then when they're not perfectly correlated, when they're moving opposite of each other, they assume that it's some sort of sign of major weakness. That's not the case. All it is is Bitcoin made a massive move here and is digesting it. The NASDAQ made a massive move here and was digesting it. And now the NASDAQ has moved and Bitcoin is not quite there yet. That's all it means. It's not some massive sign of weakness. Too many people try to uh, draw correlation between the two. I just, just, I don't, I barely look at the NASDAQ and the SPX because there really isn't any point. The Bitcoin chart tells you all that you need to know. We had a massive leg up. We're consolidating. We're going to get a massive leg up next, irrespective of what the NASDAQ does, irrespective of what the SPX does. Why do you do what you do? Why do I do what I do? I, well, I'm a trader, obviously. I've been in this space for seven years. I really enjoy it. I naturally like teaching. If I was not a trader and if the pay was better, to be a teacher, I would be a teacher. I love to teach. So it's it's fun to be able to teach people about something that I love to do. That's why I do what I do. I enjoy doing this. For the most part, the trolls can be frustrating at times and this space can get frustrating at times, but for the most part, I do it because I do, I do like to do this. That is about it, guys. That looks like I covered all the comments or as many of the important ones that I could. Thank you guys for posting those. With that being said, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this video update. If you guys did enjoy it, please like, share, and subscribe. I do appreciate all the support. The more support that you guys give me, the more inclined I am to keep providing you guys with this content. So if you enjoy it, please, please let me know through likes, through shares, through comments, through subscribes. I really do appreciate all the support, guys, and I will catch you guys in the next one.